Today's guests are Annie Sweat and Rachel Jordan with Abundant House Films. Visit with us as we explore their journey in the cutting edge movement of transforming content onto social media. They are at the cutting edge. Gary V would be very proud of them. Well, welcome guys. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Thank you. So you're with Abundant House Films, mm -hmm. but my first question is, who is Rogue Zohu? <laughs> so that was originally the name that we came up with for our production house. And it's kind of a callback to how we all got started. So our production company is made up of two different families who work together. Um, and so one of the very first projects that we worked on was called Zombie Hunters. Um, and so that's what the Zohu is short for. It's Zombie Hunters. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that was just kind of a mashup word that we made up, but the rogue was more something that we put a lot of thought into when we yeah, came we up were, with that. We were like, rogue. Okay, so we're doing something that's off the beaten path, not really what you would think of when you see us. Rogue as in doing something different or doing something unexpected. So Zombie Hunters isn't. <laughs> zombie Hunters is a callback to... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the main reasons why we changed it because it, it's really hard to explain. It didn't actually fit what we wanted to do. It was just a callback to how we got started. Yeah, because I, I noticed that on, <laughs> on the uh, YouTube channel and yeah. I'm like, oh, I love that name. What, <laughs> who is it? So it, you, thanks for explaining that. So you started, you said two families. Mm -hmm. Which families? How many of you involved? And how did you get in? How did you yeah. like really develop this into something that's really serious. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, one of the families is the Pulling family and that's actually our family. We don't have that last name anymore because we're both married now. Um, but there's five of us in the Pulling family. Rachel's the oldest mm -hmm. and then we have a brother, Philip, and then I'm third. And then we have another brother, Jose, and then our youngest sister, Lizzie. And we all do film together. And then the other family is two brothers. It's the Sweat brothers. So we actually married the those two brothers. brothers. So, oh. so I'm married to Max, and she's married to Micah, and yeah. they're okay. so Annie's last name is Sweat now, <laughs> and Max and I decided to change our name together when we got married. Hence Jordan. So we're Max and Rachel Jordan, and they're Annie and Micah Sweat. Oh. But when we met, we were the Pollings and the Sweats. Okay, Pollings, Sweats, and Jordans. You know, like a dynasty. <laughs> Sounds like a law firm, <laughs> or even better, a mega, a mega film corporation, yeah. something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yes. So, how did you start? You were homeschooled. Yes. Was this part of your homeschooling environment, or how, where did the interest come from? Who was the nexus of this? development? It was kind of me. So it's hard to talk about homeschooling sometimes because the object of it is for parents to be able to customize the education of their kids, right? So even though you can all say like all these people are homeschoolers, no one had the same experience. Right. Our parents were both um, really excited about us having every opportunity to learn whatever we wanted to learn and to provide an environment that was really conducive to art and um, like our mom is an artist and we like we had pretty much any art supplies <laughs> <laughs> you could imagine we were, when we were young we spent lots of time drawing painting creating Acting playing out. with Legos um, plays and lot, writing and yeah. all of that but the focus of it's called the lifestyle of learning approach that's the approach to homeschooling that our parents followed. The idea is it's more about the time that um, the education is driven by the child and they have all of this time. It's not bogged down by a lot of curriculum and all these tests that you have to do. They have huge blocks of time that can they can devote to anything that they want. Um, and then as long as it's um, constructive, con productive yeah, is productive. what we call it. Is, I'd like to unpack a little bit more about the homeschooling myths that are out there because I do know that a lot of colleges love homeschoolers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you listen to um, some of the commentators out there, especially Jordan Peterson and, and quite a few others mm -hmm. who are concerned about uh, the socialization, you know, yeah. the socialism that's injected into yeah. education, um, you homeschooling is a viable alternative. Mm -hmm. And so there is core, you still have to get your core <laughs> 
reading, math, yeah. skills all together. So, mm -hmm. you know, we don't want people to sort of think that, you know, you're just going to sort of <laughs> one like, run like feral children throughout the, the jungle. No. Oh, no. 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 <laughs> yes. No, so, like, just talking about how we were brought up, the children decide what they want to work on, but you the parents help them learn the skills that they need. So I want, I'm a writer, so I wanted to write things, I wanted to, I read a lot of things, and so I was the one pushing forward in gaining and those skills. And how long skills. was this when you were starting to get interested in the, well, or was it writing that led you into filmmaking? It was kind of both. We were very, me and my youngest sister, Lizzie, were very interested in theater. So we actually started writing little productions that our family put on together. How old were you when you started doing that? Uh, Ten, maybe, when she was eight. No, so I would have been twelve. It was kind of all throughout that age mm -hmm. area where we were watching things. We watched a lot of musicals and theatrical productions, and it just came out of us. So that's what the lifestyle learning is about. Is about taking what's already coming out of your children and helping them learn the skills and advancing in those skills mm -hmm. and not putting on a lot of pressure to learn it right now. So you're, more, you're more exploring and yourself, so you're, you're, you're problem solving your own yes. journey. Yes, mm -hmm. a problem solving is a huge part of it. And it sounds like it's really handy in dealing with interpersonal yes. situations. Yes. Mm -hmm. Did, That's, did you uh, learn negotiation skills or did you learn more resi self-resilience, do you think? Oh, just, I think we have a really healthy sense of ourselves and, and when, you have, when you have a healthy sense of self-respect self and you know yourself very well, it's really easy to take yourself out of the equation when you're, you're speaking and interacting with another person. So you're not dealing with your own, like, self-doubt, emotion, you know, emotional Be responses. Because you've, you've, you've got, you've banked a whole lot of experiences, right. even mm -hmm. as a kid, that you can rely on that you go, oh, it's not going to be the end of the world. Yes. I've got, I know that I just have to pick myself up and exactly. dust myself off. You it's have a lot of experience making mistakes and being okay with that and, and picking yourself back up again and doing it again the next day and dealing with your own emotions about failure and, um, you know, understanding what failure really is, which is just an opportunity to, to grow. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, and yeah. it's not anything that will, you know, and your world. <laughs> no, and I think that's a that, that's a really beautiful um, concept that we all need to examine more uh, clearly. And, and we'd love to hear from you all out there about your opinions on this, and it's, as a healthy as a healthy way of talking about education. Because if you're raising kids to be tall poppies, each one a tall poppy, and that sounds like you you were in great soil to you know. For sure. Um, help you be the best that you each could be and you know that no one else could own it but yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just a brilliant way to start life. Yeah. yeah. We're very grateful for our, for our parents to to have us in that environment cuz I know they they wanted to homeschool us before they even had kids. And, and your dad's so. quite computer, very tech. Uh yeah, our dad's an engineer. Yes. He's not necessarily a computer, but he's very um he loves tech. He, he he's loves tech, tech. <laughs> um, but that's not what he does for his job. He's he's actually an organization and efficiency expert. So we've learned a lot from him. And, and that's how I met our marvelous editor, um, Lily Allman, was through your dad. Yeah. And so uh, at Innovation Collective. So um, yeah. So you, you're not you're not from this backwoods family that is a, <laughs> no, because no. No, seriously we, we need to dispel some of these myths that are out there yeah. you know um you guys are functional what other skill sets do you see that you possess maybe compared to other mm -hmm. kids that have just gone through mainstream education for your age yeah well some of it is uh, a lot of it is personal interpersonal skills because the school environment is really when you think about it outside of that's how education is done. Um, it's really fake environment. Like nothing in the real world is actually like that. And so you actually learn a lot more about the real world, how to interact with people in the real world. And it's all under, you're very close with your parents and they can watch over you. So you're not ever dealing with interpersonal situations 
that you don't know how to deal with by yourself. And, and that's, you know, I, I think that'll blow some people's minds and they actually might feel a little bit uncomfortable about this. But uh, as a parent, I love that concept where you actually are engaged with your child for a lot longer. Yes. And, you know, you do have that normal ages and stages development stage where you yes. want to sort of hang on, you know, gravitate towards more of your peers as you hit teen age years and you still have that opportunity to do that. But it's like the schooling system has come in and just created this barrier to between you and your child. Yeah. And it's like, oh, your, your role in life is to feed them and cart them to and from school and pick them up late yeah. from their after school activities. And you, you just don't get to, to see them. And then on the weekends, it's all about their peer group soccer matches. <laughs> Yeah. And they're not, they're not learning a lot of good things in that. It's yeah, just like it's no. all about them. Life is going to die. You know, they're all going to die at 18 when they graduate, or 24, <laughs> or 30. And um, I, so I'm just, this is just lovely. And I appreciate you chatting with me about this because um, I think this is going to fit well into, is this not how then you're carrying a lot of those values mm -hmm. into Abundant House. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that uh, you were saying about parents having influence, like we are still very close with our parents and they do have a big influence on us and what we do. We often run a lot of our ideas past them. Yeah. And, and I think that's really important because who you hang out with and who you spend your time with is who you learn from. And if you're only learning from people and it, who your own age is like this feedback loop right and so it's really important socially that you're mm -hmm. interacting with and learning from people who have more experience and more wisdom than you and, and sometimes different ideas right exactly right. and you're still an individual yeah you yeah. know and uh, people sort of sometimes worry about these close families and it's just like I'm more worried about the people that are out there <laughs> homogenous <laughs> <laughs> they think they're yeah. individuals they're not yes. yeah so um, and so obviously you're allowed to develop self-expression. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah. And so when did you first pick up a camera and what was the first attempt? Yes. Um, so it was probably when I was 13, 14. I really don't remember because we were just doing stuff like that all the time. Um, but I saw a video that my friends had made and they put it up on YouTube. I was like, that looks so fun. And we were already doing like little tiny productions. And this is early days of YouTube. Yeah. Well, yeah. pretty early. It had been around for at least three, four years. Yeah. yeah. It was yeah. already a popular yeah. thing. but Yeah. So I was like, oh, we could make something like that. So I grabbed my younger brother and the camera that we already had that... Um, I don't remember why we had it, but for some project, some earlier. Oh, we in always life. had a camera. <laughs> and then I grabbed my yeah. youngest sister, who's always been interested in acting, and I'm like, "Hey, let's do something!" And ran out to the backyard and started shooting something. We were experimenting with uh, jump cutting, right, and making people disappear and reappear, and that's what we wanted to do for our first project. <laughs> magic tricks. We were very into magic tricks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the magic of it. Did you realize at that time? just how, um, and I hate to use the word democratic, but it's the, the YouTube is accessible to everybody. You don't need to be a large company. You don't need to have massive funding. Um, you can be an independent one person yeah. who can put it out there. And then it's like almost like a free market in that you, you, you sh sink or swim, you know, <laughs> it's, you know, uh, how well you do is how well it pleases everyone else out there. Did you recognize at the time, or do you realize now just how precious that is? <laughs> yeah, I realize it now. No, back then it was just, here's somewhere that we can show what we're doing to people that we know without having to have them actually physically come to our house and like put on a show. You know, nothing that we were doing felt worth that at the time. It was just silly little videos, but it was um, a platform to share. Right. Share it with people that we knew. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly now. For sure. Yeah. I think, yeah. so I, I wasn't really a part of what she's talking about. Right. I was in the middle of um, studying for a music degree and I, I had a little social media business that I was working on after and, and I graduated. What age were you when you first started on your social media business? I was 19. 
19. I graduated when I was 19 and I did that right after. So 19, 21. Um, that's about how old I was, I think. Um, it's kind of a blur. Everything in my life has faded from one thing to the <laughs> next. Yeah. There's no just jumps. Right. Really. E everything is connecting. Yeah, it's yeah. very connected. So. Yeah. Um, somewhere in there I started a small social media business and learned about social media management and stuff like that. Just because you were used to just trying stuff and doing it and mm -hmm. not worrying. Yeah, I took a course and thought that would be an interesting way to make money and I really was not very interested in doing like a retail job or you know anything like that and um, I was finishing up my music degree so I, I'll, I was also teaching like piano lessons and stuff while I was doing Just that. Just curious, so, so how many instruments do you play each? Um, play play? <laughs> <laughs> or I'm double in? Play. Play. <laughs> I used to play close to eight, I think. Um, right now it's, I mostly just do voice and piano. Yeah, um, so I think that's four for me that I could play most anything that I could read. I dabbled around in some brass, but mm -hmm. just because our brothers played brass and I knew how to play it, but I didn't really ever do anything with yeah. it. But piano, voice, flute, clarinet. Yeah. We're, we're a very, very musical family. We've been singing together since we were really little, so. It's wonderful. <laughs> and music and mathematics are really closely aligned too, so. <laughs> <laughs> so For sure. <laughs> yeah. So Abundant House or the Zoho, Rogue, Rogue Zoho. Zoho. Yeah. <laughs> Is uh, when did that when did it, when did that creation when was it born? Yes. So it was kind of an alignment of a lot of different a things. lot of different things. <laughs> one of which was we met the sweats. So uh, Max especially was very into filmmaking. He um, he had taught himself how to do um, special effects, and um, he he's actually he's a professional VFX artist. Um, that and he taught himself from scratch and um, he made lightsaber fan films. <laughs> yeah, you've got up. a lot of fan films on your uh, yeah. Side. So that's how he got started. So we met him and we saw his work and we were like, "Whoa, he's really cool!" And <laughs> so um, there's a way um, to catch gu guys. There's yeah. a way to catch <laughs> yeah. girls. Is yeah. Impress them with your with your YouTube skills. skills. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. It worked. <laughs> well, anyway. <laughs> um, we we lived kind of far apart and um, we're probably about two two and a half hours apart and we ended up moving really close to where they were and as soon as we moved it was just like we, we gotta, gotta make films together. together we gotta do stuff together <laughs> um, at that point I was fifteen or so so I had been me and my three younger sibling two younger siblings had been just keep making little projects on the side as we were learning things mm -hmm. um, so at that point. Uh, meeting Max was like, yes, he can take us to the next level and what we want to do because he's really, really good at cinematography and VFX and we were more like story and editing oriented, so it was a lot of gaps in what we could do and what we were interested in doing that he filled immediately. Mm -hmm. And so meeting him was like, we got to make something together. <laughs> we got to do it now. We got to make something cool. And literally as soon as we moved, there was a production that came to town that and they advertised in the newspaper for people to volunteer to help, which I realize now is a totally random and weird thing that no production really ever does. But <laughs> we jumped on board. We were like, yes, us, pick me. Which one was that? <laughs> so this was for a project called Ten Decades. Okay. It was the city of Enumclaw's uh, centennial. And the city commissioned a film to be made about the city of Enumclaw and its history. And it was uh, a for, a for Culture, which is a nonprofit organization that uh, provides funding for various arts projects. So it was like in collaboration with them and the city of Enumclaw. And um, we met with the director, and apparently we were kind of like the first people to volunteer. And she met us, and she was like, hey, these kids are kind of cool. <laughs> And um, she let us into the film in every aspect. Like so she mentored you? Completely. Completely. Yeah. Through the whole cradle to grave process. Yeah. She let us have influence on the script. She let us um, 
do tons of behind the scenes stuff. Um, we all worked on the crew. Um, we got to just be in on a lot of the meetings between her and like the heads of departments. And so she really advocated for us to be there because a lot of them were like, "What are these, these kids, kids doing, doing here?" What a gracious thing. Uh, we're and so what's her, grateful. What's her name? Her name's Stacy. Stacy Bernstein. Stacy Bernstein. Bernstein. Yeah. So thank you, Stacy. <laughs> We, we need more people like that out there. For yeah. sure. Very, she's obviously made a change. Yes. She was pivotal. Yeah. We were very grateful for everything that she did. Um, and that's really how Rachel got into filmmaking, because up to that point, it was just a thing that mm -hmm. we all did that you didn't really take part in very much. I didn't really. And it's mostly because I didn't know what there was. And um, when somebody says they're interested in filmmaking, like for younger kids, the first thing that they think of is, I want to be a director, or I want to be a writer, or I want to be the camera guy. Or an actor. Or an actor. <laughs> you know, those are like the only things they know about. Those are like four of hundreds of jobs that you can have in the filmmaking industry. And what I came to realize as I was working on this project and this the Stacy was meeting me and kind of just like seeing what I was good at even though I didn't know I was good at it she was like I need you to start organizing things for me so, so she got you involved in the logistics and the project management yes. which is critical most people have, don't have those skill sets <laughs> in any in, in any I don't <laughs> or I didn't <laughs> I was learning no. right and so she just kind of I actually signed up to be the makeup artist because I was really, I, that was also when I was starting my makeup business. So they kind of happened simultaneously for me because I volunteered to be the makeup artist, but in meeting me and me just kind of sitting in in all these meetings, she noticed that I was the one who was organizing things and <laughs> making things happen and asking follow-up questions and just kind of... Seeing problems before they yeah. actually became problems. And so she... Went on Which to, takes experience to identify. Yeah. So Stacy kind of let me into the process, but also just kind of asked me to do things that she saw that I would be good at. So one of the first things I did was manage the casting, which doesn't mean that I was picking the actors. It just means that I organized all of the auditions and told everybody where to be, gave all the actors their sides and just kind of managed that whole thing. And I, as soon as I did that, I was like, oh, this is really cool. This is really fun. You know, I could do this. Um, and it was just lots of little things like that. And that shoot ended up being really stressful just because we we all kind of filled in gaps and just kind of um, realized where some holes were in the production due to budget constraints and whatnot. And um, <laughs> always, budget always happens, you know, but it was our first like on set experience. And, you know, a lot of the key people on it were professional filmmakers in the Seattle area and, and so we just like we went from zero to 60 and learning within the space of a couple months it was so it was a real apprenticeship real yes. yeah and at the same time Max was filming another LCC entry and so a lightsaber film a lightsaber film um for a competition. So LCC is the lightsaber choreography competition. And he was just like, it's my year to win. And, um, <laughs> and so they have a competition just for lightsaber films then. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Ooh. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of a fun thing. Um, yeah, Max has won a couple times now, spoilers. Ooh. And he's been a judge for a couple years too. So it's been really interesting. If you watch all of his entries from beginning. I mean, who doesn't like lightsabers? Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty cool um but it was it was just really interesting kind of doing both of these projects a small project with just us in the sweats um at the same time as this larger project with the city and everything um that I ended up being way more heavily involved in than I initially volunteered for but just loved every it minute was totally of it. Volunteer volunteer work at this so it was a few it, months of volunteer work and it was almost like a full-time job it w it was mostly volunteer work I did end up working my way into some paid positions but paid is kind of more like token payment mm -hmm. just because it's it was a cultural I, thing yes, low yes, budget yes. yeah so, but I like being paid a little bit was 
awesome, but I would have done it for free just because as soon as I started, I saw what a wonderful learning opportunity it was. And, and I could have, I could do that at the time because I was young and didn't have a family to support or, you know, anything like that. I was still exploring what I wanted to do. So did it just strike you that it was like a passion, a calling? Yes, actually. Um, within probably a couple months of doing those two projects, we were all like, we need a name, we need to be doing stuff together. <laughs> what are we doing next? And what year was this? This was... 2013. Yeah, I'm glad she remembers years. I'm horrible with years. <laughs> <laughs> this the summer of 2013. Yeah, and so the next project that we did um, is probably what we're currently most well-known for, which is our Hunger Games fan film. Um, yes, would you like to tell everyone how many... I saw it on the... Mm -hmm. check, I checked up on YouTube the other day to see how many hits you'd had, how many views you'd had. Mm -hmm. That's 2.7 million. million. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, we were very strategic in choosing that um, topic to make a film on. We were actually entering a fan film competition to, when we made it, um, but we quickly realized that our ideas and ambition for <laughs> the project were very much outstripping the actual competition yeah it was like a five minute short film that's based on something that already exists this, it was like very vague rules uh, and just kind of but this, like this was uh, 19 minutes 18 minutes. yeah yes. it's almost 20 minutes yes. long and it went on to receive so if, some if, other awards besides that one <laughs> so it, it won that award and it won on some other awards mm -hmm. it was so it's called Weeping, Weeping Willow. Willow. Weeping Willow, and it is a Hunger Games fan film. Yes. And I watched it, and that little girl that's in it, oh my gosh, she's <laughs> just amazing. She is so precious. She's, and yes. your music. Mm. Was that Ellie? It wasn't Ellie. Um, Ellie was actually in the film. I don't know if was you she saw was? her. Yeah. Um, so the... And the, I'll explain who Ellie is later. <laughs> yeah, we'll explain who Ellie is, but... Um, we're, um, we wanted to do the Hunger Games because that was what was really big coming out in box offices right then. At that point, only the first Hunger yeah. Games movie had come out. Right, I think so, so just the first one. So there were three more to go. Um, and it was a big deal in the box office. So we knew that Hunger Games fan films would get a ton of hits on YouTube. Yeah. Or we hoped anyway. Um, so when we were... We were where, where, where did you film it? Because I was really impressed by your use of set, as in there wasn't much, but you made it look. <laughs> yeah, we. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we shot. It was really well done. It was literally a, um, an abandoned lot that a lot of trees had been cut down. They were going to make a golf course there, but they ran out of money, and so it was just this huge abandoned forest lot that nobody really owned and were, nothing like, was really people happening. People rode their dirt it. bikes in there all the time. It was like, literally right down the road from our house. and That was the main location. And then we um, actually where, the where, big... Where did you source the actors? I know a lot of them were your family, but that little girl, for example... Actually, she, that she's... our family was the crew, so we had almost no family in the cast. Oh, okay. we, the reason we chose Hunger Games was because we knew that we could get a lot of young people who were just excited about it and would would just love to be there for, you know, no payment, we'll feed you maybe. Um, <laughs> we didn't like, have any money. <laughs> and, and what I liked about your movies is this, it's very much like when you watch things from England or the UK of BBC, they're normal looking people. Mm. They're not these <laughs> unrealistic, <laughs> you know, teenagers who just look gorgeous and, you know. Yeah. These are normal kids, and, they are and then normal it's easy kids. for people to sort of like project themselves into that and see themselves as heroes, or mm -hmm. you know, you've got the skinny teenage boy. You know, that's that's what the average kid out there is like. N nothing, yeah, like you you would get otherwise in these faux. Yours seems so much more real and relatable. Oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah, no, I was, I was <laughs> yeah. not entirely on purpose, but we're always <laughs> learning. So. We started doing a lot of research into how to actually run films because we were moving forward with a bigger crew and wanted to work more seriously. And 
I was reading a lot of books at the time of how you, there was a couple of books for young filmmakers, how do you make films with no money as a young filmmaker, and a lot of them said you go to schools or you go to your school, your drama department, you find people who are interested in similar things. <laughs> and we're like, but we're homeschool. We're homeschool. <laughs> like, we don't have something like that to go to. And so that that's where the idea came from. Well, let's find where the homeschoolers are connected with each other. And there's associations, there's different co-ops and, and forums and whatever. So we literally sent word out to as many associations as we could find. Hey, we're homeschoolers. We're making a film. We're hosting auditions. We need 24 teenagers. <laughs> and they came in. <laughs> yep. That's how we found Nikki or Nicole is the main actress who plays Willow. She came in and she just rocked her audition. Up until that point, we were gonna have Lizzie play Willow, but she was a little bit old for Willow. I think she was 14 or 15 at the time and we really wanted someone really young. And Nicole came in and was just like, that's Willow. <laughs> she was incredible. Now, did this launch her into Yes. Modeling and other acting roles? Yes, it yes. Did. Yeah. Did it, she's did. now a model. She's like agency represented in Seattle. and um, She was brilliant. Yeah. Seriously. She, yeah, she's uh, a very. And were there any actor. other kids that also got a taste and are doing something with it? Somewhat. Ellie was in there. Yeah. Um, but she had been interested in film before, but she's continued to work with us over and over again. Um, and, and Ellie's last name is? Ellie Pledica. And she, for, for you all out there who don't know her, she is a musician and a mm -hmm. composer. Yes. And uh, in your Descent one, mm -hmm. the music there, was she involved with that one too? Yeah, yes. 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 yeah yes. Ellie was the composer for Descent. Descent. Yes. The, the music in the Hunger Games fan film was a song that was it based on a song that you liked no. not really it was based on the soundtrack from the oh, first Hunger Games yeah it was just like we wanted something that sounded similar to the soundtrack mm -hmm. but no, not actually the soundtrack yeah. for <laughs> copyright reasons right. so yeah we we had a friend who um morphed it, it it's it was that was well who was too. who composed something for us and then we also and who, was, who was that um i'm going to space on his name Ricky? Yes, Ricky Elliott. Ricky Elliott, yeah. Right. Um, and I believe if you look him up, you can see it. In I don't know if he goes Ricardo on line. Yeah. Um, Ricardo Elliott or Ricky Elliott. Yeah. Um, so that was really cool to hear what he did. It was really, really yeah. good. We also had another friend, Tiger. Um, it was kind of a mismatch of several other people because there was some crazy scheduling things going yes. on at the time. Yeah. Rachel did vocals for it, is maybe what you're thinking of. She did the voice oh. singing in mm -hmm. the soundtrack. Yeah, and it, I, I wanted it, like, there's, there's a lot of vocal elements in the original Hunger Games film, so I wanted it to sound kind of like that. So we did something similar, but not exactly the same. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. and we did the same for Descent. We, we kind of tempt, sc scored it with... Um, and and they're the we ones that I'm bringing up here because you've, you've got 82 on your channel, 82 yeah. movies mm -hmm. on your channel, which is, you know, you guys are not mucking around. You're very productive. And then you, is it you that do mostly the instructional videos mm -hmm. to you? So you're sharing the love. Yes. You're showing how for other kids to, yes. to do this. And you've got how to direct, how to write. <laughs> yes. All these little... It's a big part of who we are. We're just teachers at heart, and it's a big part of our vision to continue to provide education for, it's not even homeschooled, it's just self-taught uh, filmmakers. So, you know, it's things that I wish had been available to me when we were learning, because there was nothing. There's a lot out there now, besides what I'm doing. Um, but when I started filmmaking, there was nothing, and I really needed something, because I was always like, I know there's more. I know there's more that I need to get better at, but I don't know what it is. Thank you for watching the video. I know that you're excited and following these people. Hit like, hit subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And we look forward to hearing from you and seeing you in your journey too.